We're going to go to Romans chapter 12, Romans chapter 12 verses 9 to 21. So this is, this is interesting because this talks about behaving like a Christian. This passage is all about how we behave. So, if we want to know whether someone's a Christian like, this is a good place to start. It's a good place to look. There's lots of places where they give you different applications of, of what your life should look like. So this is what it looks like to be a Christian. So measure yourself. That's the important thing. We need to measure ourselves. I have to measure myself by what God says about me and I know that I fall short of his glory many times but my heart is changed and I want to follow God that's the important thing when we really want to follow God things will change if we really want to make sure that we are you know safe in God's kingdom something else happens in that we become um, at peace this is where the peace comes from you see the Holy Spirit makes his home in us and he lives in us and so his spirit aligns itself with our spirit and then we have peace well what happens when we decide to remember what I was saying about dabbling in the world you know one foot in the world yeah oh I like some of those things I'll just go back there and do some of those things and it'll be okay well the Holy Spirit's with you so before you could go and do that one problem because you didn't have the Holy Spirit you were just on your own you, you're the spirit of man. This is your, your heart was in this. It wasn't in God's kingdom. It was in the world. So while you're in the world, Satan doesn't bother with you. Oh, that's interesting. So Satan hasn't bothered with me too much. I can do this and nothing happens. But now I'm a Christian. Now I have the Holy Spirit. Now I'm born again, spiritually. I've got a different master that I serve. So is that master me still? Or is that master Jesus Christ? What am I doing with my life? What's happening? So there's a different, there's a different thing that's happening. There's a change. So when I go and dabble in the world, whereas before I felt okay about it, now... It doesn't feel right. Now there's something that kind of, I don't feel easy. I feel a kind of a dis-ease because I'm back into the, into the pandemic. I'm back into the pandemic of mammon. I'm back into the pandemic of Satan's world. I'm back into that virus that soon gets un into your blood in the world because it's there from the beginning and I thought I had some antibodies well we do we have the antibodies and it's called the Holy Spirit and so when I go dabble the antibodies say oh no that don't work I don't like that we need to get rid of that and so we might go back there and be happy for a while but we don't feel easy about it we don't feel right about it and suddenly we our conscience begins to prick us the Holy Spirit begins to speak to us the Holy Spirit is our guide our counselor and he counsels us as not the right way mate it's not the right way don't go there it's not helping you this is your Achilles heel you're getting seduced back into the world this is your temptation it's not right come out return to me that I may return to you because the Holy Spirit will say that and then he will he will withdraw because the Holy Spirit is a gentleman and if you're insistent in going back into the world the Holy Spirit's going to let you do that He's going to advise you, he's going to lead you, he's going to guide you. But if you, it are, you know, we can be really insistent. We can be very stubborn, right? Anybody stubborn here? There's some stubborn people here. Any stubborn sheep? Yeah, ma, ma, I'm going to go where I want to. Ma, ma, I'm not going to follow the shepherd. Ma, ma, I'm going to fall in a ditch. It's okay. Oh, ma, ma. I'm off running around. <laughs> I'm definitely a lost sheep. And, you know, if you come with me, I'll guide you as well. Ma, we'll go together. Ma, ma, we'll both fall in the ditch. That's great. Excellent. <laughs> What a great idea. And the Holy Spirit says, <laughs> carry on. <coughs> carry on then. I'm lifting my hand of blessing. You know, before you were blessed, you weren't falling in ditches. Before when you got saved, you were safe and you felt peace and joy. And now when you're there, you're feeling that peace and joy still? Are you feeling that peace and joy still where you are? Not really. And what happens? 
Return to me that I might return to you, it says in, uh, in Jeremiah chapter 15. That's what he's talking about. And now we have the Holy Spirit. And he prompts us. And he gives us, creates a new heart. He opens our eyes and our ears of understanding so we can understand the parables of Jesus. So we can understand the spiritual message that's coming through this word. Not just the literal words on the page, but the spiritual message that God has for us underneath, behind those words. I require mercy and not sacrifice. I am calling you through love, God says. Through Christ. Christ is love. Christ is showing you this is the way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So unless we're following Christ, unless we say no to this, with, and God will be at our back, he will help us. Unless we say no to this and stay with what God wants for us, we're going to be, we're not going to be at peace. We're going to lose our joy, that deep joy that we have in us. We're going to lose our trust for God because we already began to lose it by going back into the world, by going back to the things that we knew before, by, shall we say, what do you do when, you, when you're dating? You, you go back into a kind of seduction. And that's what the world does, really. It's seducing you back to itself. It's going to keep coming at you. It's in you. And you have to keep putting it to death. You have to keep putting the old man to death because the flesh is always there rising. Because that's where you come from. You've come out of the world. So although you're still in it, you're not of the world anymore, but it's still there in you. You're still having to fight it on a daily basis. You still have to take up your cross on a daily basis, fighting the old man, putting to death the old man. That is your cross, putting to death the old man. When Jesus was on the cross and he died for your sins, he was putting to death your old man. He paid the price for our old man. He, put, he paid the price so that we could get away from Egypt he paid the price for you and I that we might live because that's not life it's life we thought it was life we were enticed to believe it was life and yet it, it never really gave us the satisfaction or the fulfillment that we wanted and it could be okay for a while but then it would always turn to rats. There's always something in it that wasn't working. There was always something in it that made us feel bad. It always caused problems. There was always relational problems. There's always problems going on. And just because we become Christians don't mean to say those, those problems aren't there. We're still in the flesh. We still have an enemy called the flesh. It's an enemy. The world, the flesh and the devil and death and punishment are our enemies. These five enemies we have. And so we have to put to death the old man. We have to move into the new man. Paul's explaining here, let love be without hypocrisy. <laughs> well, we're all hypocrites. <laughs> Every one of us has a sense of hypocrisy because we are sinful by nature and it will always creep in but let love be without hypocrisy this is this is what we attain to we're not saying we're there yet but this is how we need to learn how to behave and when we get fully into God's camp when we follow Christ this will become second nature over time you become attuned to this you grow new neuro pathways you have new desires you begin to understand what is what is precious and what is vile. You begin to understand the difference between gold and fool's gold. You begin to understand that this life, what this life offers you, is nothing. Absolutely nothing is rubbish compared to the 
amazing things that God has for you in Christ. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. There is, there is a need for you to cling to these good things. You know, you need to have a different mind. We have to have the mind of Christ. When you become saved, your mind is, starts to change. First your heart changes, that's the spirit of man. Your heart begins to change. You fall in love with Jesus. You fall in love with God. You restore your relationship with God through the Holy Spirit. God shows you how much he loves you because he gives you his only son, Jesus Christ. And he willingly goes to the cross for you. That is unconditional love. He, he, he did that when you hated him. When you were in rebellion against God, he still died for you. So that is what came. That's what happened. And so that changes your heart. And by the renewing of the word, by the renewing of your mind through the word, you become a different person. You have different thoughts and desires. The old man is still there, but now you have a new heart. You have started to renew your mind by the word and you begin to think the thoughts and you begin to develop the mind of Christ. It happens immediately because your heart is after God and suddenly you start to question things that you did before and you want to know how to do it right and that, that, and so therefore that that learning that developmental process comes from you being an infant in Christ to growing to become uh, a young man and, and then a father in the faith that's what happens there is this development and so you begin to abhor what is evil you abhor you actually abhor your Achilles heel that those temptations you had before you begin to hate them because they separated you from Christ and that's why you need to stay away from them abhor what is evil cling to what is good so you have to cling to Christ you have to cling to the journey with Christ you have to cling to becoming a disciple of Christ that's what you need to do verse 10 says be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love in honor giving preference to one another so straight away it changes our attitude towards other people around us our brothers and sisters in Christ this is the first thing to be kindly affectionate to one another you know that's that's a real that's a real difference you know before you might have felt in competition with other people or you looked down on other people you may have even despised other people and you certainly were very judgment of other people and you can get quite legalistic if we know what's right and we know what's wrong we can get quite legalistic in our attitude but it says be kindly affectionate to one another that's a different story verse 11 not lagging in diligence fervent in spirit serving the Lord so this is part of your service we're talking about this is what God expects this is not just what you want to do because you feel like it this is what is expected of the believer that you actually don't lack in diligence don't get behind on on doing this of being kindly affectionate if you are not being kindly affectionate you're out of step you're out of order you need to get with the program you're not in the right place you're not exercising God's grace in your life and so this is important you have to be fervent in spirit you see you may not be able to do this the spirit of man is, is basically controlled by the world and once your spirit is made alive in Christ guess what now you have the Holy Spirit and so you can walk in the spirit aligned with the Holy Spirit you can walk in your new awakened spirit your new connected spirit and you can be different and you have to do it with diligence serving the Lord so it's all about serving the Lord so when you're kindly affectionate to one another who are you serving are you serving yourself I don't think so are you serving the other person yes and that's where the resentment comes in because if someone's not being kindly affectionate to you or because someone isn't what you want them to be to you or for you or anything else you're not going to want to be kindly affectionate to them but that's still a service that you have to offer and why do you do that because you are serving the Lord because what God has done for you 
that's what changes your heart and makes you loving and kind towards other people because how can you how can you not love other people if God loved you with all your faults when you were in rebellion to the father he sent his son to die for you so that is love which is unconditional you didn't warrant it you never earned it and you certainly couldn't pay for it but God loved you so much that that's what he did for you and we are to be like Christ and if Christ willingly went to the cross for you how can you show your respect and love back to God this is it by being kindly affectionate this is your act of service not lagging being fervent you know enthusiastic about it don't just oh yeah okay well I'll I'll give them a hug, you know, when it's the peace time. I don't really want to, but, you know, you know, oh yeah, give me a hug. Yeah? Oh yeah, I don't like this person, but I'll give them a hug anyway. No, that's not right. That's not the right attitude. You need to see Christ in each one here, and you need to give them a hug. COVID-19 willing. You know, you need to give them a hug, even if it's a, a mental hug even if it's an elbow you need to do whatever you need to do but affectionately being kind to that person and it's affectionate you know what affectionate is it's where you like someone where you like each other you know you're affectionate you, you you're you're being you're being very kind in in a very um, gracious and merciful way and and there's a connection why there's a connection of the holy spirit for a start you know, if St. Francis of Assisi could go up to a leper and kiss him on the mouth because he saw Christ in him, how can we not be kindly affectionate to one another today, even if that person isn't that lovable to you, generally? That person may be very unattractive to you in all manner of ways. But this is what we're supposed to do. It says, verse 12, Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer distributing to the needs of the saints given to hospitality so these are all the ways in which we're showing that we really are believers this is where we're showing we really are truly of the Lord rejoicing in hope that's interesting isn't it rejoicing in hope what is our hope our hope is that we get closer to the Lord our hope that we have a heavenly home our hope is that in faith we live our lives we trust in God we are patient that's patient with other people we need to be patient with ourselves too we shouldn't be beating ourselves up we should when we're getting it wrong we should be patient knowing that God is patient with us and we should honor God with our patience because he is well he's long suffering God is long suffering he's suffered you a long time <laughs> he's suffered me a long time he's very long suffering and so we have to accept the fact that God is patient and kind and so we are to be like God we are to follow Christ who shows us the example of God and so he was patient patient in tribulation so patient in trials patient in problems that you're going through to be patient in those problems you know that's the important thing continuing steadfastly in prayer trusting in God that your prayers are heard that's why it's that's what it's talking about don't give up on the fact that you haven't had an answer that may be your answer not yet that may be your answer it may be that you're praying for something like you win the lottery next week and that isn't what God wants. He doesn't want you to think of monetary gain. He wants you to think of other things. And so he may not answer that directly. But, you know, he will supply your needs. He will supply more needs if you're serving him for the needs that you need when you're serving. He will supply more needs for that area than just supplying needs for you. He'll give you all your basic needs, but he'll give you more if you're doing something with what he's given you. 
Think of the talents. The parable of the talents. So, distributing to the needs of the saints. Now, this was obviously in a very poor time, very poor situation. And giving to the needs of the saints. The saints are those who are saved. The saints are those who have been redeemed. The saints are born-again believers. That's what we're talking about. We are saints in the kingdom of God. We were sinners, now we've become saints. We still have a sinful nature that we have to fight, but we've become saints in the kingdom. We've become the righteousness of God. We've become princes and princesses in God's kingdom. We are part of his family now. We are no longer just worms and, saint and, and sinners. You know, no longer are we to continue in that way. And so distribute to the needs so the deacons this is why the deacons were formed in the early church so that the apostles could get on with preaching and teaching and building the church by spreading the gospel very widely and, and in a very anointed way and then they appointed deacons who were also spiritual men and women spiritual men generally and so they appointed spiritual men to look after the needs of the flock, to look after the widows and the orphans. And this is the people in the church. So we have a need for people to step up and help people, other saints, other believers in the church. It's very, very important. Um, given to hospitality. Do you have hospitality? Are you a kind of hospitality person? I always remember one pastor coming to me and saying, you know, it was amazing. He came around for a meal with him, him and his wife. And he said, you know, I have never been invited by any other pastor in this city to come and have a meal. He could be a bit obnoxious at times, but I really loved him. <laughs> He's a great guy. But that's what he said. And it's, he said it's unusual. Why is it unusual? Why is that unusual today? We should be actually able to go and you know, invite someone for a meal and go out together or, or have a meal to be hospitable to be welcoming you know to invite people to encourage people to to be prepared to you know give to people that's what it's about being hospitable bringing them into your life bringing them into your home okay they may not be your favourite person but that's not the point as believers we all serve the one God and so therefore we need to see past the problems that people have and still work with people and still serve people because we're serving God as we serve others it says verse 15 uh, 14 bless those who persecute you bless and do not curse so people are going to curse you they are going to curse you because once you once you get firmly in God's camp and you are doing the things of God and you're living for God you have changed the way you are you're no longer in their world existence you have come out of that and this is what I'm saying to people who are on in addictions you need to come out of that that's your Achilles heel so there's only one way you're probably going to get free of this and that is to change your lifestyle if you're always going back like a pig returns to the vomit if you're always going back to the old lifestyle then you're probably not going to break away from it because you have too many things there that that you know remind you of what you had before and so we need to change that we need to be blessing people who persecute us um, and uh, and not curse people because there are people that are going to get fed up with you and I'm going to think you're bad because you're not doing the same things they are anymore. And, and, you know, I lost a few friends when I became a Christian because I knew that carrying on in their lifestyle wasn't good for me. And, and one of my best friends didn't want to leave that lifestyle. And actually, I, I recognized that he was getting worse and worse. He was getting more and more drunk. The drunken periods were getting longer and longer. And I was with him in that to start with. I was a drunkard as well at one point, probably very much bordering on alcoholism, drinking every day, 10, 15 brandies a night. You know, I was a real good time lad at one time. We're going back a long time now, thank goodness. But, you know, when I was saved, when I was brought out of that, when God dealt with that in me, I don't, I don't need that now. 
but people blessed did not bless me at the time because when you are when you are kind of trying to come out of something they think you're rejecting them I wasn't rejecting them and I was happy to meet the person outside of all that go for a coffee and meet up and still be pals but they don't see it like that in their eyes you've 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 rejected them you've abandoned them you're no longer a friend you've decided that you don't want anything to do with them and so you will get cursed they will slag you off people will cause all sorts of problems for you if they think that you're especially if they think you're being self-righteous and you're looking down on what they are doing because you've now decided you're going to do something different then you must really be looking down on them and so they feel that even if you're not being that way even if you're being very loving and kind and saying look I love you I just don't want to be in that lifestyle anymore but they don't see that because it's it's the offense of the cross it's the offense when you want to live a holy life and someone wants to carry on in their vileness they are offended it's that's the way it is it says in this verse 15 rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep be of the same mind toward one another do not set your mind on high things but associate with the humble do not be wise in your own opinion so wisdom doesn't come from my own opinion wisdom comes from God wisdom comes from devouring God's word wisdom comes from meditating on the word of God day and night and learning how to apply what God shows me about himself what God shows me about me when he shines the light on me through this scripture and I begin to understand me and I begin to understand what my life was like before and what my life is like now and I begin to understand the differences that need to take place in a person's life and how to apply his word to my life this is wisdom that's what wisdom is it's godly wisdom it's not my own opinion it's godly wisdom I have learned from what God has shown me it, I have not just become intelligent overnight you know the intelligence was there but the wisdom wasn't there I had worldly wisdom sure I had common sense and there were certain things that I did but it still dragged me into all sorts of stuff but now God's wisdom keeps me out of it and following God is a different way of life and I become wise about what's good for me I become wise about what's good for the family what's good for the church because God has given it to us through his word we become understanding of what God's standards are and how to live a life that is pleasing and honoring to God through the word there's the wisdom that's where it comes from and that's how we apply it, it says in verse 16 this is very important be of the same mind towards one another do not set your mind on high things but associate with the humble <coughs> now if we have the mind of Christ Christ humbled himself for us he humbled himself by coming as a baby in a manger he humbled himself by dying for us on the cross an amazing feat and so we are to do the same be of the same mind toward one another if we have the mind of Christ you will find that in a church that is following the word and following God and not following the opinions of people and not following a pastor that's untrained and doesn't really know what he's doing and doesn't really have well God's wisdom but has worldly wisdom that church is going to be all over the place because there's going to be some people there that really have the mind of Christ and there's going to be other people in that church that have the total opposite and and they won't know the right way they won't have the teaching that shows them the right path and so that that is going to be divided it's not going to stand and so therefore it's not going to work long term but if you have people that are marionating in the word that are really gaining God's wisdom and how to apply God's word to their lives how to become a believer and you begin to think similar things when you're taught what God wants and you have 
the mind of Christ then we have consensus in the church so whatever direction we're going whatever we're teaching people are in agreement they they recognize the voice of God through his word through the preaching and teaching and everyone comes along at the same pace we're all learning the same things together and so people become they become like Christ there is the mind of Christ that is is embedding itself in everybody's brain and so we we have this agreement there is there is a spiritual relational agreement that goes on that when we that when one person stands up and says something that's opposite to what God says or what God wants everybody knows straight away that wasn't from God and so it's a safety thing as well this is the ark the church is the ark we come into the ark to learn and grow and develop and it's a place of safety so you're not going to get <coughs> if everyone's following the same Bible if everyone's got an open Bible in on their lap when we're preaching and teaching and they can see from the word that we're preaching from the word and not just from our own worldly opinions <coughs> It's, there's a safety in that. There's a secure. You know, you're hearing God's verse or God's word. You can hear it. You can see it yourself, and you can know whether the words are saying that or not. And you get to know what is actually spiritual and what is worldly. And you begin to see the difference. You begin to gain discernment. You begin to learn that discernment. And that's what it's saying here. Be of the same mind. You know, it doesn't take long in a church before you realise if someone's out of step. It's like being in the army, in the army or whatever. when I was in the RAF, we had to march. You know, the first thing we had to do was learn how to march together, because it's to build cohesion, it's to build a oneness in the unit. It's everyone relies on everybody else. Because if one person gets out of step and they mess up, it it it, it affects everybody. Everyone gets told off, <laughs> and so you begin to learn to live under authority. You begin to learn to live as a unit to live that what you do affects other people well in a church it's the same thing we need to be in step we need to follow what God wants so being of the same mind is really important as we use the same mind towards each other we know how to behave as believers true believers verse 17 says repay no one evil for evil if that's your attitude that you if someone hits you you have to hit them ten times harder this is not right we mustn't repay evil with evil have regard for good things in the sight of all men so it doesn't matter who it is who's standing before you you have to have sight of good things verse 18 if it is possible as much as depends on you live peaceably with all men this is where grace comes in this is where the Holy Spirit is evident that he's in you if you have the Holy Spirit you will be at peace and you will want to be peaceable you will want to be a peace lover you will want to be a peacemaker this is living peaceably with all men not some of them not just the ones you like because uh, we can all do that mm. it's about being at peace as much as you can possibly do to be at peace and live at peace with all men that's what it's about live peaceably with all men verse 19 beloved do not avenge yourselves but rather give place to the wrath give place to the anger that's what it's saying do not avenge yourself you know we do tend to be resentful and we we harbor things in our hearts and we mustn't do that we mustn't be vengeful people we're not to be malicious we're not to have vendettas we're not to keep things going it's a different story the church is a different place we need to come people need to feel safe here and so if there's any vendettas we need to deal with them don't avenge yourself but rather give place to the wrath. Give place to that anger. So if someone is angry with you, give place to it. Allow it. Let it go. They don't have to avenge it. Does that make sense? So even if someone's doing you, doing you no good, even if someone is angry towards you, even if someone's got a problem with you, even if someone's got a bone to pick with you, let it go. Live at peace. Try to be a peacemaker in that situation. If you're doing something they don't like, well, accept the fact that you're not perfect and maybe there's something in what you're doing that is aggravating other people. And it may just be your attitude about it. The fact that you don't seem to care if other people 
are upset with you. No, that, that's, even that can be quite aggravating. Even that can show that you don't really care. So don't avenge anyone who comes to you and says, I'm really you know, unhappy with this, or, or starts to be a bit funny with you. Try and find out what is going on. Speak to the person directly. Matthew 18, about discipline. Go to the person directly and say, I feel there's something going on between us here. I want to be right with you because I want to be right with God. Can we talk about this? Can we work out what's going on? We don't go slagging them off to someone else. We don't go talking about them behind their back. We, we talk to the person and say, look, this is the situation I'm facing. Can you help me? I want to get right with God here and I want to make sure that we don't have a problem between us. We're brothers and sisters after all. Let's work this out. We're people of the living God. We're children of the living God. We need to work it out. bit difficult if you've lived in a big family and they're all at odds with each other. Maybe that's difficult for you. You don't understand how to make peace. You don't have know how to make up and, and work through conflicts maybe you just fight maybe that's what's going on but this is no place for the church this is no place for the believer this has to change for the future you have to change with with what's with what's in you it's got to show that something else is in you it says in verse 18 if it's possible as much as depends on you live peaceably with all men that's really important for the believer And he says something very, very important here in verse 19. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves. Do not avenge. He's not saying don't avenge yourself. He's saying don't avenge your own feelings and emotions about things. You know, don't take revenge on other people because of what you're feeling. That's what he's saying. But rather give place to the anger, for it's written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. So we don't have to worry about someone doing something wrong to us and getting away with it. See, that's what we're worried about. <laughs> we're worried about someone getting away with something. That's why people don't like to forgive. Well, if I forgive them, they'll get away. No. If you forgive them, you're going to get away with it. Because that unforgiveness is a bitter root of resentment and it will build up. It causes you problems. It's like... You expect it's like you taking poison and expecting someone else to be hurt by it. It's it's no good. Forgiveness is letting go of stuff, not for them, for you. Obviously it has a knock on effect, the person's forgiven, so then they can actually start to think sensibly about you and the fact that you are different than the world. You are a different type of person because you are forgiving, you are a peacemaker. So now this person is forgiving towards me and is a peacemaker and is trying to make peace with me. I don't like what they did, but I must be the same. And so this is how it works. <laughs> and it's not easy for some people, but Jesus said, if you don't forgive others, your Heavenly Father won't forgive you. No, you can't just ignore that. You can't say, well, I don't care. I'm not going to forgive them anyway. No. <laughs> it doesn't work. It doesn't work at all. And you're showing yourself up with wrong fruit. You're not showing the fruit of Christ. You're showing something else. You know, Satan is the destroyer. Satan comes to kill, steal and destroy. He's the deceiver of the brethren. So he, that's his mode, is to kill, steal and destroy. Well, what is it if you're unforgiving? Really, you want to kill, steal or destroy or maybe you're just indifferent and that's the same it has the same effect verse 20 says therefore if your enemy hungers feed him if he thirsts give him a drink for in so doing you will heap coals of fire on his head in other words you will make that person really think and um, they can't hold things against you if you're loving and and kind and and forgiving and generous and and merciful they can't hold it against you it's it's almost impossible you know one of the things that that melt us is, is love. When someone loves us, it melts our heart. When Christ loved you and showed how much he loved you by dying on the cross, it melts your heart. You have a debt to pay. How can you be, how can you be anti-Christ when he's gone willingly to the cross to, to pay for your sins? You have a debt of honour. If nothing else, it's a debt of honour. 
But if it didn't melt your heart, something's not quite right with your heart. You haven't really fully understood what God's done for you. It should have melted your heart. It should have shown you how hard you are. And that is something that cannot continue if you want to be a believer. You have to be free of all that. It says in verse 21, Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. We are more than conquerors in Christ. We have to be overcomers. You are an overcomer when you become a child of God. When you have the Holy Spirit. You have the Holy Spirit's power in you to be an overcomer. So you're not doing it in your own strength. You're doing it because God has given you that gift of the Holy Spirit. And so that the Holy Spirit in you is going to lead you into all righteousness. He's going to empower you. You know, one of the things that happened with the disciples uh, and the apostles on the day of Pentecost, they were emboldened. They were, they were given power from on high. You see, once you really fully get into God's camp and you fully decide to, to follow God, that you fully trust God for everything and you want and need the power to serve Him, God knows your heart and the minute you step up and want to serve God, He will give you the power to do so. The more you want to follow God, the more blessing you're going to get, the more power you're going to get in the Holy Spirit to be able to do what God wants you to do and to serve Him. This is important.